Hey everyone, Victor is here, your organic chemistry tutor, and today I want to talk about two nightmare terms that many students struggle with, that is stereospecific and stereoselective. There are a lot of terms in stereochemistry that we use to describe the individual molecules, such as chiral, achiral, or a meso compound. We also have terms to describe the relationships between the stereoisomers, we have enantiomers and diastereomers. But we can also describe the stereo chemical outcomes of reactions using the terms stereospecific and stereoselective. And despite what many people think, these two terms are not mutually exclusive. This is actually a fairly common misconception, so remember, the reaction can be either stereospecific or it can be stereoselective and it can be stereospecific or it can potentially be neither. So let's talk about each of those terms in details. So when it comes to the stereoselective reactions, the definition that we have from the gold book of the IUPAC nomenclature says that in the case of the stereoselective reactions, the reaction is going to give you one stereoisomer over another stereoisomer. So what that means in normal terms is that if you have some sort of a reaction and you have a starting material, that starting material can produce a pair of stereoisomers, which can be either enantiomers or diastereomers. But what is important here is that one of those products is going to be a major product, while the other one is going to be a minor product. Let me illustrate that with an example. So let's say we have an epoxidation reaction over here. Just a typical epoxidation where we have a double bond, we are reacting it with metachloroperbenzoic acid, and we are getting adding an epoxide as our product. In this case, the relationship between our two products here is enantiomers. And we are going to get roughly 50% of each of those enantiomers. So in other words, what we have here is the racemic mixture. And since in this case we are not seeing any selectivity towards one of the two possible products, we are going to say that this reaction is not stereoselective. However, if we compare that to, let's say, sharpless epoxidation, where I take the same starting material, I have a little bit different combination of the reagents here. It's not just MCPBA anymore, I'm going to make the same two products in this case. However, in this case, one of those products, the one that I have over here on the right side, that guy is going to be made in a staggering 98% and that is going to be our major product compared only to 2% of the other possible product in this case. And since now one of the stereoisomers is the major stereoisomer, we are going to say that this reaction is in fact stereoselective. So when one starting material gives you a couple of stereoisomers as products and one of those stereoisomers is the major product, we have a stereoselective reaction. Now, when it comes to the stereospecific reactions, the things are a little bit more interesting. The official definition states that whenever we have a stereospecific reaction, we are going to have starting materials that differ in the configuration and that is going to give you different stereo isomeric outcomes. The definition here also says that if reaction is stereospecific, it is going to be stereoselective as well. I have a little bit of a problem with this part of the definition and I'll explain why in a couple of moments here, but for right now we'll just go with this definition. But this definition is very mouthful. So translating that from awkward to English, we're going to say that in the case of the stereospecific reactions, the stereo configuration of the starting materials going to determine the stereo configuration of our products. So what I mean by that is that if we have two different starting materials and those starting materials are stereoisomers, let's say like enantiomers or diastereomers, and they give the corresponding products in the course of some sort of reaction, then those products are also going to be stereoisomers of each other. And the important thing here to keep in mind is that our starting material 1 will always give you product 1. It is not going to give you product 2. Likewise, starting material 2 will give you product 2 and not product 1. So, for instance, 
Let's say I have a classic example of the stereospecific reaction where I take this uh, trans steel bean, this E steel bean, and I'm doing the reaction with Br2. From sophomore organic chemistry, we know that this reaction is an anti-addition, and in this case, we are going to get the product that looks like that, where our bromines are looking in the opposite directions. Well, this particular molecule is a mesa compound, so we are not going to be making multiple stereo isomers as our products, just one product. This is an achiral molecule. However, if now I'm going to do the same reaction but with the Z isomer of my starting material, I'm going to end up with a pair of enantiomers. So my E starting material will always be giving me a mesa compound in this particular reaction, while my Z stereoisomer for the starting material is going to end up giving me a pair of enantiomers. I do want to point out, however, that when it comes to our pair of enantiomers for the second reaction, we are going to end up with a 50-50% mixture, so we are going to end up with a racemic mixture, so based on the definition of the stereoselective reaction, this is actually not stereoselective. I will remind you that in the case of the stereoselective reactions, reaction has the one stereoisomer preferred over the other stereoisomer, but in this case, we have two stereoisomers preferred over the overall three stereoisomers that we would get theoretically possible in a reaction like that, and the two stereoisomers that we get here, they're not actually formed in any excess, so here we have, you know, 50-50 mixture of two uh, stereoisomers as a result of our reaction. That's why I have a problem with the definition that says that all stereospecific reactions are also stereoselective, because in this case, while well, we are not really having any stereoselectivity based on the strict definition of that. So if it was up to me, I would just take the definition of the stereospecific reactions and would just scratch out this part over here, where it says that all stereospecific reactions are also stereoselective because as I have just demonstrated, we have a problem with that. But at the end of the day, I'm just an old chemist yelling into the void, so who cares about what I think here. Anyways, coming back to our stereospecific reactions, as you can see, you will have to keep a lot of information in mind in order to figure out the difference between the stereospecific and the stereoselective reactions. And of course, there is a somewhat of an easy trick. And the first step in your easy trick or a shortcut, if you like, is of course to hit the like button. And as soon as you do that, then we are going to remember that as soon as you hear that the mechanism for your reaction is going to be sin or anti or an SN2 style reaction, or in general, any concerted mechanism, in all of those cases, you can automatically think that this is going to be a stereospecific reaction. So, for instance, our anti-additions like the halogenation or the oxyhalogenation or dihydroxylation via epoxide and things like that, they are a good example of stereospecific reaction and we have this magic word anti over here. Likewise, our syn additions, so like hydrogenation or epoxidation, cyclopropanation, hydroboration, reaction with osmium oxide and many, many, many other ones. Again, we have a magic word seen here, so that is going to be a stereospecific reaction. And finally, of course, we have SN2 reactions. There are not really many examples here because SN2 is, well, SN2 and that's about it, but SN2 reactions, they are also stereospecific reactions. So as a take-home message, remember that in the case of the stereoselective reactions, you are going to have one starting material making two different products that are stereoisomers of each other, and one of those products is going to be the major product. And in the case of the stereospecific reactions, you're going to have two starting materials which are stereoisomers of each other, and they are each going to give you different products. And as I've mentioned before, for our stereospecific reactions, it is physically impossible for starting material one to give product two 
or for starting material 2 to give product 1. So for stereoselective reactions, starting material gives both guys, but one is more preferred than the other one. In the case of the stereospecific reactions, however, our starting material can only give one style or one stereo configuration of our final product and that's it. We cannot form the other version, the other stereo isomer. And that's about it. Go to organicchemistrytutor.com for practice questions and more tutorials. Check out this video next and I will see you next time.